to here. This is the midbrain section. If you follow closely, the portion which is posterior to the aqueduct of Sylvius, this region, is known as the tectal area. And the portion anteriorly is known as the tegmentum of the midbrain. If you follow the tectum, tectal area, this area is known as the quadrigeminal plate. It has got two swellings, one superiorly, one inferiorly. The superior swelling is the superior colliculus, the inferior swelling is the inferior colliculus. The superior swelling is concerned with visual reflexes, like visual body reflex. The inferior swelling is concerned with auditory localization, with auditory processing. Like they say, when there's a thunderstorm going on, you see a lightning first, and then you hear the thunder. So you see the lightning first, and then you hear the thunder. That's what they say. So this whole thing is that. To continue with the story of the pineal tumor, which I was talking about a little earlier, this is the location of the pineal gland. Once the pineal gland tumor enlarges, after it compresses the posterior commissure, it can even compress on the superior colliculus and all the structures in this region, and then it can give rise to a condition known as Parinaud syndrome, where there is paralysis of convergence and paralysis of upward gaze, because the upward gaze center is situated in this part of the midbrain, and that upward gaze center is known as the rostral interstitial nucleus of MLF. Okay, let's not digress too much. Come back here. The aqueduct of Sylvius leads into the fourth ventricle. What are the boundaries of the fourth ventricle? The fourth ventricle is bounded by the pons in its upper half, medulla in its lower half, anteriorly. Posteriorly, it is bounded by a tent-shaped roof consisting of an upper half and a lower half. The upper half of the tent-shaped roof is known as the superior medullary velum, which is a thin sheet of gray and white matter. And the inferior half of the tent-shaped roof is, form, is called the inferior medullary velum, which does not contain any neural tissue. It contains only pia mater and ependyma, that's all. So this is the boundary of the fourth ventricle. This is the floor of the fourth ventricle, which is also known as the rhomboid fossa. We can see only one half of it because this is a sagittal section. And as I told you a little while back, upper half of the floor is formed by the pons, the lower half of the floor is formed by the posterior surface of the medulla. If you look closely, this frond-like structure which we see here, this is the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. The choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle is situated only in the inferior medullary velum. The superior medullary velum does not contain any choroid plexus. So this is the choroid plexus. And what is also seen here is this opening where my probe is situated right now. This is the location. This is the location of the foramen of Magendai. What is the foramen of Magendai? It is the foramen, midline foramen, through which the fourth ventricle communicates with the cerebellomedullary cistern, subarachnoid cistern. This is the foramen of Magendai. Laterally will be situated the foramen of Lushka. The foramen of Lushka will be situated further laterally. That is also known as the pontomedullary cistern, or the cerebellum, the pontomedullary cerebellopontine angle cistern. Okay. So these are the structures which constitute the components of the ventricular system. Now I'll say a few words about all the other structures which are visible in this particular dissection. Let's start from below. As I mentioned in the beginning, this whole thing is the brainstem. This portion from here to here is the midbrain. This is the tegmentum of the midbrain. Sorry, one more time, it blurred out. Sorry? Do it one more time, it blurred. Okay. This portion from here to here is the midbrain. The portion anterior is called the tegmentum of the midbrain, the posterior posterior is called the tectum. The tegmentum of the midbrain, if you see closely, this area here, this is known as the decussation of the pyramids. What does it do? 
it gives rise to the crisscrossing fibers from all the deep nuclei of the cerebellum, deep nuclei of the cerebellum, the vestigial, interposed, and dentate nucleus, all those which go towards the red nucleus and the thalamus, they all decussate in the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle. I've already described the tectum, the superior and the inferior colliculus. Let's come to the lower part. This section from here to here is the pons. The anterior portion of the pons is known as the basilar part of the pons. And if you look closely, you will find that the basilar part of pons has got the descending corticospinal tracts, the corticobulbar tracts, and it also contains the corticopontine fibers. These are, the, these are all situated in the basilar part of pons. This is the site of central pontine myelinolysis. The portion posteriorly is known as the tegmentum of the pons, which is continuous with the tegmentum of the midbrain. This is the tegmentum of the midbrain. And this is the site of hemorrhage, which we had described as Duret's hemorrhage, when there's a tentorial coning. Incidentally, if you look, follow this up, you'll find that the tegmentum of the midbrain becomes continuous with the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Or to put it the other way around, the thalamus and the hypothalamus becomes continuous inferiorly with the tegmentum of the midbrain, which is continuous with the tegmentum of the pons. And finally, this is the medulla. Most of the medulla has been cut here, but if I were to trace these fibers down, then this portion would have been the pyramids of the medulla, which contains the corticospinal tracts. So these are the structures in the midbrain, brainstem. This portion that we see here, this is the vermis of the cerebellum, the cut section of the vermis of the cerebellum. And if you take a good look at this, you'll find that this has got a central core of white matter with multiple fronts of gray matter. This is known as the arbor vitae, or the tree of life. This is referred to as the arbor, this cut appearance is called the arbor vitae, or the tree of life. Consisting of a central core of white matter with a surrounding rim of gray matter. It has got several components, we shall not describe them, they are not important for us at this stage. Let us continue. This thin membrane that we see here, this is the septum pellucidum. What is the septum pellucidum? It is composed, it's a thin double layer membrane. It is composed of ependyma on either side and a thin double layer of ependyma with a slit-like space in between. This septum pellucidum stretches between the fornix here, this is the fornix, and the body and the genu of corpus callosum. This septum pellucidum separates one lateral ventricle from the other lateral ventricle. And as we have already mentioned, this is the interventricular foramen of Monroe. So this is the structure here. This is our corpus callosum. This is the rostrum of the corpus callosum. This thin inferior most limit. The rostrum continues up as the genu of the corpus callosum. Then it continues as the body of the corpus callosum. This is the cut section. The corpus callosum is much extensive. And it continues and ends in the large enlarged posterior portion, which is known as the splenium of the corpus callosum. Take a good hard look at this structure here, this space to be more precise. This triangular space that we see here, this is known as the, cere the cistern of the great cerebral vein of Galen, or the cerebellomedullary cistern. Uh, sorry, correct me, not cerebellomedullary. This is known as the great cistern of the great cerebral vein of Galen. This is bounded anteriorly by the tectum of the midbrain. Superiorly, it is bounded by the splenium of the corpus callosum, and inferiorly, it is bounded by the cerebellum. This cistern contains the great cerebral vein. The great cerebral vein of Galen runs under this. Okay. This sulcus, which is situated around the corpus callosum, this is known as the callosal sulcus. And that separates 
it from the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere of the cortex, which we had already described. Okay, can shut up.